Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, as Josh said, my name is Jane Adams. I'm a first generation American. Um, and I work with antique photographs in a lot of ways, um, primarily animating stereographic images and digitally colorizing antique photographs. And I've got some video for you. Okay, so mostly we're going to be on the video, but um, I'll try to give you a heads up if I'm going to be showing you something and you will be able to move your slider back over to me. So my story really starts here with my mom. This is a picture taken on her first Christmas in the U.S. after immigrating from Bergen in 1969. She stayed, she had children, but most of her family is still in Norway. So I'm straddling the same line as a lot of the people in the photos I collect. I'm homesick with one foot in each country, romanticizing the place that I can't be in right now, especially the last couple of years. So our family, like many, many others, carried on a few traditions in this country, and one of those is Bunad. There's baby me, ain't I cute? Um... And it's important to understand a few things about early photography before we start looking at the colorization process. So the photographic camera was invented in the first half of the 19th century. And these early processes are orthochromatic. That means that blue looks white and red looks black. So uh, the colorization process really depends on the original tones of the photo. So we can just assume that most of these original photos um, they're not accurate. And the whole process is really best viewed as artistic and not historical. If you take a look at some of these older black and white photos, they're really not similar to the black and white film we're familiar with today. If you're familiar at all with some of these costumes, you know that those vests are like a pretty bright red, but in the photos, they look really dark, right? Now, most of the clothing that we're gonna look at today is folk dress, not bunad. So just really quickly, folk dress is any clothing worn by rural Norwegians before the 20th century. The bunad is officially recognized national costume, which are based on these earlier garments. But in the 1800s, painting had gotten as realistic as possible and photography remains inferior in a lot of ways for accurate documentation until color film which doesn't really take off until like the 1960s. So, okay, so if you're looking around in a museum archive for examples of older folk dress, you're gonna find that there's this time period where the watercolors by the early researchers are way more descriptive than these like black and white mug shots taken by later staff. Like there's this time period where they almost look like they were Xeroxed. Um, but there are these like really beautiful, much older, really detailed watercolor studies of some of these objects. Um, so the photo colorization is almost as old as photography itself, but a lot of these early folk dress photos were staged with garments mixed and matched for artistic tastes and colorized with more regard for sales appeal than accuracy. Solveig Lund is a really good example of that. Um, she's sort of working as a photographer in this sort of birth of the Bunad era, but um, she really took a lot of liberties. So these colorized postcards from the turn of the century are perhaps some of the most iconic images of early folk dress in Norway, but at the same time, sometimes they're the least informed. The first Bunad that is loaded with the national pride we feel today is the Nationalen, which shown here is a simplified version of the Hardanger Bunad. It starts appearing in the late 1800s, and it is worn to show support for the dissolution of the union between Norway and Sweden that would finally give Norway its full independence in 1905. It's not as finely made as its folk dress predecessors, and it would not have replaced formal dress. If you want to learn more about the early Bunad, you can see um, Hildegardborg, Clara Sem, and Agat Nos, and I'm sure that Lauren will drop those in the chat for you. So, Let's take a look at some photo colorization. 
This is a portrait of Gertrude Aga from the collection of the Westerheim. And we've actually got her original vest and her beaded chest plate, which is super helpful as a reference for colorizing. So before we get started with the colorization, we've got to clean up the image. Um, this is a PSA to store your old photos in archival products. Um, a lot of photos this old get sort of a surface mildew or fading, a lot of scratches. Sometimes children have practiced writing their name in crayon. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So we've really got to go in and clean that up. What's really interesting about this portrait is it really seems like she's wearing a mix of the Nationalen and the Hardanger Bunad. Um, that shirt and that belt are full on proper Hardanger Bunad, but that vest to me is a little more simplistic, kind of like the Nationalen. Um, and so you'll see this, the further you go back in folk dress history, the more people are like, kind of mixing and matching based on what's in fashion or what they have, or you know, maybe they've inherited one piece and they've got most of the rest of this other costume. And so you really see much more of a, an individual flair in each of these costumes. Um, but if you'd like to take a closer look at that shirt and you want to take a look at me for a minute, I've got a proper hard on your blouse from around the same time as hers would be from. Um, my aunt, who's from Hardanger, was kind enough to give this to me last time I visited. There are so many more color layers in the human face than you would imagine usually four or five layers for me, just adding in like the right undertones. Inger i sletten av sillejord Har det verken sølv eller so you can really see how bright that original vest is compared to how it photographed. And that's a really great example of what orthochromatic film processes will do. So there are a lot of limitations with colorizing these older photos um, because I can't put in tones that aren't there. It's really more tinting than coloring. If any of you are um, into collecting old textiles, buy all of the antique ribbon and lace you can because we do not make them like that anymore. If you have ever tried to make your own full dress, you will know that ribbon like this is really hard to find. And um, if some of you aren't familiar with this style of costume, those are all little teeny tiny feet. So these chest plates are really intricately bead embroidered. And you could drive yourself crazy colorizing those if you want to, but I, unless it's a really close up image, just go for the general feel of it. And this is a West Coast costume, so we know that her jewelry is gold. Now we don't have her original belt, but we know what they look like. I'm going to take a look at me. I've got three really great examples of how her belt would look. This is the Hardanger Bunad belt, but it's also used in Tana.
and those can be either woven or embroidered, depending. A lot of times with these white linen pieces, I will just go over the whole thing in a color I can actually see. And then I'll move the slider until it's a color that I would actually want. So just in case you think I'm making for yellow, I'm just trying to um, see my outlines, make sure I'm not coloring over anything else. Usually end up going with like just a tint of blue to give it that nice bleached linen look. The wood always looks really cool once it's colorized. I had never actually seen anyone holding live roses in a studio portrait before. It's usually a, a prop, like a Tina box or something. I thought those were a really nice touch. Colorizing these backgrounds is tough because, um, you know, they're for black and white photography, so they weren't a color. They were usually like light brown or light green. So I usually just kind of hit them with a solid color. Now stereo views are sets of two photos taken from slightly different angles. So when you look at them through this device, they create a 3D image. Have you ever had one of those like red plastic view masters? It's the same technology. Um, they're really, if you think about it, they're the first virtual reality goggles. Um, they're invented in the early 1800s and they very quickly become the most popular form of entertainment for middle and upper class families. Um, there's a hidden audience here, and that's the immigrant population. So between 1825 and 1925, more than 800,000 Norwegians immigrated to North America. Most of them never went home again. So I can't stress enough how popular and comforting these cards were to the immigrant community. Most of them show rural life, specific mountains or waterfalls or um, skating. People are very often in full dress and not modern dress. That's not always the case. These are how many do not. So let's take a quick peek at what that animation process looks like. This stereo is from the West China Collection, and this is a young couple from San So the good ones sort of have a front, a middle, and a background, and the key is to line it up with that middle ground, and then you get the, the optimal sort of 3D effect. Now that you're familiar with the process, let's take a look at some of these colors. Here's a view of a peasant woman in Florida. a found photograph from my collection. It's a girl at both the shirts and the month from the Lady 200. This is a woman at the fish market in the other club. She's one of my favorites. This one's really special because the 
modern part of the ride is nowhere near as intricate as that. Um, that feedback is very special now. This is a photo from the 1860s by Keith Gibson. And here is his colorization from that time. Here's some of Susan Moon's photographs, um, the boss bride. Group portrait from my personal collection from the early 1900s. And I'm gonna stop right there because I want you to look at their belts. Hey if Jane. You, yeah. Um, we're having just a little bit of trouble with the um, the music volume. If you would turn that down just a tab, I know we balanced those levels beforehand. Oh, um, got it. But thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So if you take a look at their belts, this is a really good indicator that they are wearing nationalin and not the hardong or bootnod, because those are just normal belts. Those are nice dressy belts from the early 1900s. They are not beaded. Um, they're nothing special really. I mean, no offense ladies, but um, this is sort of uh, what we look for when we're trying to figure out exactly what someone's wearing. And this one almost started a war. Uh, this was a client commission. And after I colorized it, they went looking for that bunad. Turns out it was borrowed, but um, that was from Rogaland in 1948. And here's another one of Sulve Lund. Um, this is a bride from Sietestal, but she's actually wearing the clothes backwards, which shows how much things could get mixed up in the studios. Here is another photograph from the Westerheim collection. This is a family from Gol in Hallingdal. Their names are Sivar and Jörun Lavrud. So first we clean it up. It's really not fair to see how fast it looks when it's sped up. Um, these take quite some time. Again, store your photos nicely, please. It's a lot easier to sort of take one big swipe with each color and then go in and erase where you don't want it than it is to sit there and try to color in between every line. So as we move into her dress, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the colors that you would choose if you were um, looking at these costumes and not super aware of uh, what they would look like. It's always a safe bet um, to colorize the embroidered details, um, anything that would have been done in wool or the wool fabric with colors derived from natural dyes. Um, most common colors that we see in most 
full costume is red, blue, green, yellow, white, and black. That being said, synthetic dyes have been a big business since 1860. Um, and if people could get their hands on something that was a bright, nice color, believe it, they did. So it's super easy to think of our ancestors as like really um, mild people um, because we're used to looking at them in black and white. But this peasant culture in Norway is pretty colorful, especially if you look at like the way people painted the inside of their homes. So um, try to remember that. If your great great grandmother could get her hands on neon pink wool, she did. Silk can really be any color um, at this time period. I mean, silk tends to be pretty bright. Sometimes I'll just throw some colors on and then um, move the slider around until I think it looks good. But um, I mean, you can look at all the silk scarves you want in the museum archives and they're all gonna be different and they're all gonna be loud. And because they're in Eastern Norway, we can bet that their jewelry is silver. And I don't know if you noticed before I start colorizing, but they're just outside. They've pinned a sheet or something to the outside of their house. There's like leaves, there's a wood pile in between them. Um, just dressed in their Sunday best by the wood pile for their portrait. And there they are. Sivir and Jörun Lavrud. We have a, a few questions here in the chat um, for your first part here. Um, a few people just um, had some comments that the colorizing of the photos seemed like magic. So uh, passing that along, there's someone with the same name as me in the chat, which I um, was chuckling about. So. Um, I think, Lorraine, maybe I'll let you pose your question first while I dig for the screen here. Sure. Well, Jane, this is so much fun. It really brings these to life. You feel like you knew your ancestors, or even if these weren't ancestors, you get to know the people a little bit. Um, I'm pleased that you were able to do this for uh, some of Vesterheim's photographs. And you mentioned that the other photographs are from your collection. Tell us about your collection. How, how does something make it into your collection? Well, we don't, I, I don't think very many of the Norwegian diaspora actually has a lot of family photos from this specific time period because photos were rare. They were a special occasion. Most of us were pretty rural and most of us were really poor. So like I've got, I can think of maybe like four photos of my great, great grandparents and that's it. Um, so for me, what I tend to look for um, are, you know, prints that are from this time period that actually show folk dress. So like the girl from Bolkesha and Telemark, like she's, that's her outfit. You can tell that those are her clothes. She's not staged. She's not in a studio. No one pulled a bunch of clothes out of a box and like put makeup on her. And um, the studio portraits are really cool. I don't mean to bash them so much, but I really think that something that would make a photo worth, um, you know, taking up space in my house, which is really small, um, are those really special things where you're like, that is someone in their natural element at this really special time where people still dress like this. And it seems like the stereo cards would be a great way to have a collection that includes folk dress because often the place is identified there. 
Absolutely. And it, um, there's always a blurb on the back. Um, well, I shouldn't say always because some of them are smaller print runs or a smaller, you know, sort of more amateur photography vibe, but the ones from like Keystone, for example, um, they always have a big blurb on the back and it talks about what the person's doing sort of a day in the life. And I think sometimes they're like written two years later by someone who has no idea what they're talking about, but they are charming in their own way. In the next question on here, I think is a, a pretty fun one. Um, and I think you have some good stories about it, but you know, you have this lovely collection of different pieces of folk dress. What are some ways that those have come into your life? And uh, do you thrift them? Do you look online? Uh, tell us about that a little bit. Well, um, we were talking a little bit before we got started tonight about my fauna bunads. Um, I've got a women's bunad and a men's, most of a, a men's bunad and several other pieces that sort of predate the bunad tradition, but I think it's all from one family. Um, and I drove almost to Canada to buy them. Um, when I got there, she handed me my weird Danish costumes in two separate trash bags. Um, she had the women's shirts that like the neck is like this big, you know, and um, they're like this short, had them with the men's costumes. So I had to buy them both to get them all. Um, and she had listed them as like, uh, they've got the shirts have blood on them because Norwegians are crazy. Um, but there's blood on every shirt because you're holding it together with pins and you're getting yourself dressed at like seven o'clock in the morning before brunch. And um, yeah, I've, I've actually never seen a used white Bunod shirt um, or full dress shirt without blood on it. Um, but yeah, I, they just sort of come from all over. And once you start an entire Instagram like and website and kind of career like devoted to this stuff, people just sort of come out of the woodwork and they're like, I found this thing. Is it yours? Or I get texts like, are these your people? And it'll be like some insanely rare pair of hand embroidered mittens from like before 1900 at an estate sale that my friend finds for $5. So it's really just about putting it out into the universe and letting it come to you. Now, Jane, I know you have a large body of material that you use to inform the colorizing. You've gotten to show us a few of the pieces uh, from your family, uh, but also I know that you keep records of the things that you see on trips to Norway and on other research. How do you keep track of all of this to pull up for some of these projects? <laughs> uh, my computer is really low on space. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I definitely, I try to keep folders of like, these are, um, you know, sod roof houses that I like in color. These are, you know, houses from a certain time period. These are uh, paintings that I really like. You know, oh, I've seen this costume before and now I know what she looked like in watercolors in the 1800s. And um, so it's really just absorbing as much material as possible and kind of thinking outside the box. Um, you know, if I'm on a hike, I'm like, oh, I like the way that moss looks. And I ran into moss that I couldn't find the colors for recently, like just sort of absorbing um, as much material as possible. Could you throw the, show the three belts again? I was fascinated that it was basically the same pattern, but the colors were very different on each one. Yeah, so this is the one that came with our uh, trash bag fauna costume and all of these are bead embroidered, but I do have some somewhere that are loom woven. They almost look the same, um, but when they're bead embroidered, the beads will be diagonal. And when they're loom woven, they'll be um, vertical. So here's one. And then this is the one that I made to wear with that costume because um, those beads would all be gone in a heartbeat if I tried to sit down in the original. And then here is another that came with its Brice Duke when I bought it that is in similar colors. Um, but yeah, there's really no, 
there are loose rules as to what colors the beads should be, but uh, materials could be kind of scarce and um, people could be kind of poor. So a lot of times people just sort of used what they had or made it work or repaired something with, you know, beads that would be like totally the wrong size or whatever, because that's what they had. So there was no like Michaels down the street, you know, they didn't like pop in somewhere on their way to Trader Joe's. It was really like, use what you got and, you know, pay attention to the way this should look, but there's no, like, no one's going to bang on your door and tell you you did it wrong. Those are gorgeous. Thanks. And there's a, a few questions here, Jane, concerning um, various specifications of folk dress. And I think rather than asking about specifics on different um, folk dress or bunads, I think maybe I'll ask you, you know, what are some of the things that went into informing those regional patterns? Is it tradition, religion, status? Is it um, like isolation or profession, age? What, what goes into some of that um, in short? I know that's a kind of complex question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you could have like 20 different talks on the history of folk dress in Norway and just dig into so many different um, things that sort of collided to create this really unique tradition. I mean, they're, they're geographical, they're political, they're religious, they're superstitious. There's so much. Um, but I've got this really great book. Um, I think it might be difficult to find and harder to read, but if anyone was interested, it's um, Our Old Peasant Culture by Christopher Wiestead, V-I-S-T-E-D. And this one's from 1923, but uh, from the intro, it looks like he put something similar out in 1908 and then revisited it. But um, I sort of loosely translated what he had to say about folk dress because I thought that it was really nicely put. And it was written sort of at this time when people were really sort of establishing what we know today as the Bunad culture. So he says, in the old days, the clothes played a greater role in community life than in our time. A large part of the movable property was mixed into clothes, and these thereby came to express both the owner's social position and wealth conditions to a greater degree than in our modern leveling times. Wealthy people used a lot of decoration of the garment, but our peasants have in this respect developed a great deal of taste and imagination. And the fine handwork, which especially in the mountain villages was used so richly on both the man and woman costume, contributed considerably to the festive character which the old peasant costumes had. Um, the perishability of the fabric and the consequent frequent renewal means that new formations are constantly occurring in the field of clothing and that this is very susceptible to external fashion influences. Moreover, there's a great deal of leeway here for personal taste, which all contributes to giving the folk dress history its great richness and diversity of varying forms like no other field. In fast growing lands with many sharply demarcated settlements, it was also the best soil for the development of settlement peculiarities. And this is therefore a particularly interesting aspect of the history of our peasant lands. Not only have the different parts of the country undergone a diverse development, but also the individual settlements have produced costumes with distinctive special features. In village groups, there have been a lot of minor differences in the details of the garment, so that the villagers in different details in cut and decoration could even decide from which parish the wearer of the garment was. So basically, um, you know, each little region had their own sort of private brand of uh, how things looked. But within that, everybody had their um, their own spin on it based on their personal tastes. And also, like even in 1908, he's saying that like these are super influenced by um, outside fashion, right? Whatever's popular at the time. And so I think it's really important to remember that the costume is kind of a fragile ecosystem. Like every generation, this is in danger of extinction. If one element becomes unpopular for a generation, it doesn't usually return. Like the scout, pretty much only in Hardanger are women still covering their hair, but that used to be every region. All married women covered their hair. Um, 
uh, that's that's where we're going from that quote. You had commented earlier about uh, the introduction of synthetic dyes, and there was a question in the chat about the transition from handwoven fabric for folk dress and to uh, commercially woven fabric for folk dress. You know, that's really not um, not something that I'm super familiar with. Um, other than that during the industrial revolution, um, it became more and more common to purchase factory woven woolens. And of course those were still produced in Norway because that was a giant industry in Norway were the woolen mills. So even if you weren't weaving your own fabric at home, you were probably weaving your own fabric at work. I'm gonna combine a few questions, a few questions here. Um, and just, I wanna remind folks to, if you can drop your questions in the Q and A feature, that helps us kind of sort those a little bit. I'm afraid we might lose some of you in the chat as that keeps to grow a little bit. Uh, there's been some questions about various symbols and um, meanings or superstitions that might be associated with different garments throughout time. And of course that's another expansive subject, but maybe you could hit on a few things. Yeah, um, gosh, let's see. Um, well, silver was a really big part of folklore. Um, babies were always given uh, some piece of silver, either a coin like tucked into their garment or um, a lot of times you'll get a, a really teeny tiny surya, smaller than this um, at your baptism or something. But um, before then, it was really important to give it to the baby ASAP, like before the baptism, because before they were baptized, they could be swapped for a, a baby belonging to the huldrafolk, the hidden people. Um, and so you have to keep in mind that like infant mortality was so, so, so heartbreakingly high at this time. Um, you know, at modern medicine in Norway, like late late in coming. For a while, there were a lot of regions where bathing was considered bad for you. I mean, really, I can't stress enough how many children didn't grow up, didn't live long enough um, to, to become adults in this time. And so a lot of times what it would be would be a, a baby had rickets or something. And um, people found it easier to believe that the baby had been swapped with uh, a baby belonging to the Hildrefolk, especially since, you know, rickets in particular sort of causes some, some deformities um, in the baby that um, they thought that if they had this silver on their baby, maybe the Hildrefolk would take the silver instead of the child and spare the life of their child. We've loved that pattern that's on the beaded belt. And so one of our guests would like to know the name for that star-shaped pattern in Norwegian. That is not a snowflake, not a star. It is the eight petaled rose, um, which is also um, can be related to the mod, of course, um, which was the a symbol of uh, protection that would protect you from nightwear, nightmares, um, Mada being mare. So uh, Maudit is the word for nightmare. And um, it was believed because you always woke up in a sweat from a nightmare that um, in your sleep, you had been like riding this, this nightmare horse, which is pretty imaginative. <laughs> I think a lot of us are here tonight with uh, a certain fascination and understanding for folk dress and all its forms in Norway. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit to the power of preserving these traditions. I mean, it feels like it's something that we're all really drawn to. And I think for immigrants, you know, preserving these traditions is something really, really important. But, you know, for you, why why is it important for you to be studying these traditions and sharing them and, and keeping them going. Like I said, uh, in every generation, this is in danger of extinction. So even when it seems like it's so popular and everybody has one and it's this like big status symbol that's happened before, you know, and things slow down. Um, 
and the, the, the handwork and the really, really specific knowledge that goes into these things. And a lot of these um, methods of construction that really predate, you know, sewing machines and sergers and um, there's a lot to know. And if someone doesn't know it, it can't be taught. Um, and I think that that's what a lot of the people, you know, in the last 60, 70 years have really sort of focused on as like each regional costume of which there are several hundred um, has really specific techniques and um, styles and things to know. And you could, you could live so many lifetimes and not not take in all of it. I mean, people, even who specialize in this, people who do this, you know, as, as a living that they make one specific costume, maybe two from their area. They don't know everything because if they knew everything, they wouldn't know the thing that they're doing as well as they do. Um, people in Norway teach their region of Bunad, but they don't teach them all. And so it really is a collective effort, this preservation. And I'm just trying to do my part because I feel that it is important and I am honored to be a link in that chain. And um, I just hope that someone, you know, 20 years younger than me cares enough to learn someday. Tell us what you're wearing tonight, Jane. Hmm. Uh, I am wearing a Festracht. So this is not a Bunad and I guess, you could sort of think of Festracht as where things diverge in two directions after the folk dress tradition. So um, Festracht is just sort of a, a formal attire that's a little bit less, um, less showy and often less um, difficult to wiggle into than a full bunad. And so this is what I usually wear for anything less than Sydney or a wedding, because the fauna bunad that I have is probably the most uncomfortable garment I've ever worn in my life. And if I can avoid wearing it for anything other than like the creme de la creme of occasions, I will. There's a few questions, Jane, about uh, precious metals. Um, Joanna says, my great grandmother's solia was copper and the hanging parts were diamonds from the Ustland and Moose regions. Uh, she wanted to know when was copper used rather than silver? And I know you mentioned some distinctions about where you've seen different kinds of silver across Norway. So before, um... I, I, copper specifically, um, I'm not so sure, but I can tell you that before um, metal gets really standardized in the 1800s, um, late 1800s, I think, Lorian, I don't know if you know exactly when the, the later, um, like the 830 silver stamping um, becomes official, but before that, um, as I've mentioned, Norwegians were really poor, um, really, really poor. Uh, you see a lot of like lower grade or blended metals. Um, and so it's, you know, it's pretty common to have alloys and things that are not sterling silver. Um, and even then, even the things that are gold, they're gilded. Not that that's not nice, but like there's not solid gold, like, you know, um, Sulia out there, that would be insane. They're really big pieces. So like that much gold, I mean, you'd get mugged probably even in Norway. And I know we don't love mugging there as much as we love it here, but, um, yeah, it's, it's usually, uh, gilding is as nice as it gets. Not that they're not still really expensive. We've also had some comments in the chat about um, how your presentation touches on the universality of some of these elements, like uh, wishing to protect children, and that even if you aren't Norwegian, many cultures in the world have a tradition of uh, protective garments or protective elements to keep babies safe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I think that the more cultures you study, the more you realize how, how similar we are, both in motifs. I mean, that um, 
eight petaled rose, that motif is found in like Persia, Turkey. I mean, those motifs are so much older than any of us. And um, you sort of start to see this like fount of like subconscious, um, you know, textile symbolism sort of develop as you look across cultures and realize that we love the same colors, the same shapes, and we do have the same prayers for, for our offspring. Dean, I think I want our last question to maybe be a little bit of a show and tell. I know you have a few other pieces that you showed us beforehand. Um, maybe you could show those to us and then we'll wrap up a little bit. Yeah, um, so I, uh, the women's fauna trash bag bunad is tucked away safely in the cedar chest, but um, some people have sort of brought up before that you don't really see a lot of men in these photographs and, um, you know, men's bunad is, and, and folk dress is something that comes in and out of fashion. Um, but I would like to show you an example of uh, some of the men's dress. Um, these are pink. You're not, uh, you're not seeing the wrong color. These are <laughs> pink and white. Um, sock bands that came with this men's fauna bunad. Like I said, if your great great grandmother could get her hands on hot pink yarn, she did. And this is one of the vests that goes with the men's fauna bunad. And this is something that you'll see very commonly. Um, we were under Danish rule for like 400 years, right? So what did we do with all those coins when we got our independence from Denmark? We made them into buttons. So um, modern men's fauna bunads have like reproductions of these buttons, but these are the real deal. And you can see there's like several different Danish kings represented. And then we see those buttons again on the men's pants and some really nice embroidered details. As you can see, those buttonholes are all done by hand. Everything is buttonhole stitched really finely. Um, and for those of you who have not seen the men's pants before, they are not buttoned down the middle, they're buttoned at the top and again on the inside. <laughs>